Hi guys, so we're having win after win at the moment. I've just spent three days, as you know, uh, processing our pork. Well, two days on the butchering and then a further day on processing and starting to make ham and stuff. And my son has just literally got his last mouthful of, what is it, Tom? Oh, <laughs> what is it? Sausage and egg muffin to copy the ones at McDonald's. And how was it? Better than McDonald's. <laughs> and not only that, but Rockus, my other son, he had one first and the report was exactly the same. Better than McDonald's. So I know it sounds silly. It sounds silly to be comparing what we're doing to something like McDonald's because it's just the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. But I'm just, thrilled because to get the kids involved and enjoying this process it's you know a huge step I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled that is going down as huge wins and that's why I wanted to start with those I started with the sausage and egg muffins because I know that they're something that the kids really look forward to at McDonald's and um, it was just a good way to get in there now Rockers I'm coming to find you what did you have for lunch? Uh, I had a sausage and egg McMuffin. McMuffin? Yeah. And? It was good. Compare it to McDonald's? Better. Promise? Yeah. Mm! So that's, <laughs> that's a huge step because it's like it's over a hump. When I was butchering. Oh. Sorry, Ty, you can go through. Oh, okay. No, no idea where he is. So the reason I'm so excited, I'm talking quietly. When I was butchering, my youngest son, Torrin, said, I'm not eating any of that. So that's why it's really important for me to get over that hump, that first piece. And uh, that's why I chose to do it that way. I bought these muffins a couple of days ago, knowing that this was my plan. This is my in if you like. So no, I'm just thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. So I'm now about to go off because I need to buy some more salt because um, if you've been following along, you will know that I have in the fridge here, we've got hams and bacons curing. And I'll show you this process in a minute. I've done a whole video on how to make your own bacon. I did it a long time ago when I was first starting out. So my persona on camera is very, very different. And they're a bit harder to watch, some of my earlier videos, I won't lie. But if you wanted to go and see the whole process in one video, then check that out, how to make, I don't know what it's called, how to make homemade bacon or something like that, or make your own bacon. But you can see here, look at this moisture. So here's our cure, and this is all moisture that's been drawn out of the meat, sat above it. So every day now, we need to pour that off and then top up with cure anywhere that's missing. And um, I only started these yesterday and I ran out of, salt so i've got to go and get some more and then at some point either today or tomorrow is new year's day i'm filming this on new year's eve obviously so either today or on the 2nd of january i should be receiving in the mail a load of curing salt which is what i'm going to be using to start this giant ham turning into prosciutto and then at the top there we've got the ribs that i've kept out so i'll be cooking them in the next few days and this is a bag of sausage meat. This was twice the size this morning. And uh, me and my boys have all had sausage and egg muffins. So that's that. I'm going off to get some salt now. My wife's just informed me that I might have been pronouncing that ham wrong <laughs> all these times. I've been pronouncing it prosciutto, assuming that the double T was kind of like a shh. But what are you saying? Prosciutto. My wife says prosciutto, just tell me who's right or if we're both wrong. It's really difficult to find pronunciations online. So send me in the right direction, please. I want to be able to pronounce it right, but we all know what I'm talking about, don't we? Do you know what I'm talking about, Torrin? No. no, no. Hang on then. Oh, apparently Torrin's always right. Sorry, love. Uh -huh. Who's always right? Uh -huh. Who's always right? <laughs> How do you pronounce it, Tor? Uh -huh. Do you pronounce it mum's way or dad's way? 
is most likely to be right. Can I go home? What? Can I go home? This is your home. No. <laughs> On the phone. It's recording. Yeah, can I go home? Yes. Really? <laughs> so I've just got back and I've got our cure, I've got our extra salt. So I've just mixed up some cure and if you've been following along, you'll already know all this is, is just a 50-50 mix of sugar and salt. And I need to basically do this every day for around a week is how long I am anticipating it taking. So we'll take our first piece of, I think, belly pork out which is going to be bacon, our second piece of belly pork out, which is going to be bacon, and then our two hams, and look at all that moisture that the salt is drawing out of the meat. The idea of this curing process is to pull the moisture out of the meat and we'll be left with, look at that, look at all that moisture in there, look. So we're just going to pull that away. and then top up with more cure. And you can see already the color change. You obviously can't feel it, but I can feel it going a little bit, you know, tougher like you'd expect to with a ham. So we're gonna, I think what I might do actually, because this is the first day, obviously the first day draws out more moisture than the rest, but these are gonna be amazing homemade hams. So I'm just gonna make sure that I get all the moisture out of here, and then I'm gonna put a slightly, a slight layer on the bottom of the new cure as well. But you're not gonna need nearly as much on, you know, what is today, the second day and subsequent days as you needed on the first day when you needed to coat the whole thing. Although we are coating the whole thing, we've obviously got a massive head start because we've got most of the cure already there. You just come in a bit closer, mate, and show the... So I, if you remember what this looked like, it's already the outsides are looking like they're turning into ham, which is fantastic. and. If you remember, I was a little bit short on the cure, so I couldn't be quite as liberal as I wanted, but this really is how you want it if you, you know, if you've got the cure to do it, so that it's all totally covered. There we go. So that's now gonna go back in the fridge, and then tomorrow we'll do the same again. And then that is literally all we're gonna do. We're gonna do that every day for about a week. And then at the end of it, what we'll have is rather than having two pork, leg joints we'll have two pieces of ham i'm really excited about that and in here you can see there's much less moisture there's not really anything to pour away so i'm just going to make sure this has all got a good covering i will again like i just did put a, a new dusting top and bottom of the cure just to make sure that we're doing everything we can to pull out that moisture But we've got two cuts of belly pork. We've got this one and the one we're about to do next. And I've treated them both exactly the same, but surprisingly, it just goes to show, you know, all, so much of what we do, whether it's curing bacon in this really simple way, whether it's making sourdough, whatever it is, there's more art to it than science than you might think when, you, when you're doing it old fashioned ways, you know, homesteady, because we've got two cuts here that to all intents and purposes are virtually identical. This one's a little bit smaller, if anything. But this one, we've got that moisture running off it, and the other one, we just didn't. But I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried at all. It's even more surprising when you take into account they both came from the same animal. So I'm gonna put a dusting on the bottom again, and then I'm gonna turn this over, because as you can see, if you have a look, most of what was on the bottom wasn't sticking to the bottom, so I'm gonna make sure that we've got plenty up here of the new, the new cure, and this is going to finish what I've made. In fact, not quite enough, so I'm gonna quickly make a little bit more. Stop. I've just mixed another little bit of cure, and I'm gonna just give this a really liberal coating. So your subsequent days, you should need less but I can't really overdo it at this stage because I'm going to be adding more to it every day. And the more I put in there now, the less extra it'll need down the line. But there we go. That's our three boxes of curing meat. They'll now go back in the fridge until tomorrow. And like I was saying about it being more art than science, you might find down the line that they don't need doing every day. And you might find that you, you miss a day, or, you know, day five or day six. You just don't worry about it. 
You might not, it's just a case of monitoring it. And once the moisture stops coming out, then you know you're there. But I can't wait to share the final results with you. Obviously I won't bother including this on every video because you've seen both of the, the steps, the main steps now. But uh, I will definitely show you the end, the final result. And also, you know, I could apologize, but I don't think I'm going to apologize for the videos this week being so pork centric. It's quite a massive deal. Now, even when we used to use a butcher to harvest our pork, the day that we would get all of that meat would, was still a big deal because, you know, we're talking about bringing in a substantial portion of our diet, a substantial portion of our meat intake for sure for subsequent months. So it is a big deal. It's a big deal to us and it's a big part of the cycles that, that we live here. So the reason that, you know, and this time even more so where I've been so personally involved, I've done all the processing myself, it's, it feels even more important. So basically there's been three days where that has consumed me, you know, that's been all I've thought about for three days. And now we're at the stage where we're doing, you know, other things, but some other things with it. So we are, like I say, making the bacon, making the hams, and in a couple of days making the prosciutto. I can't, tell me. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, yeah, so in the next few days, there, you know, there's going to be more references to it, but always, it's not all we're doing. Uh, my wife's just put her big coat on because she's about to go outside and collect the eggs. Obviously, we've already done the animals and everything else, which is, you know, part of what we do every day. There's a lot we're, we're doing here that we do all the time. One thing we're not doing at the moment is milking goats. Now, the plan, as you know, was to milk goats right through. We were going to keep one of our goats in milk while we serviced the other two and got those pregnant, but it didn't work out because she got a bladder infection. So I miss that. You know, we're missing the, the milk, but come March, April time, we'll be milking again. And then hopefully we'll be able to plan it again so that we milk right through. And we'll always be milking and always have milk in the house that's come from our goats. So that's the plan. And I don't see any reason why that, why that won't be the case. It's a bit weird buying milk when you produce so much of it, but we don't have access to it at the moment. And it's just a bit weird. Milk is so important because it doesn't just provide us with the milk for coffee and cereal. And I love coffee. That's gonna be an issue for me later this year. You Sorry, love. Coffee. Huh? Did you say coffee? I did say coffee. My wife just put her hand up. Yes, please. I'll make you a coffee, love. Um, but the milk isn't just for, you know, coffee and cereal, but it also makes desserts. You know, we make ice cream out of it. It makes butter, it makes cream, it makes all these different products. It makes cheese. And without the milk coming into the house, we're not making any of those things. Now, I do make quite a lot of cheese, so I'm, I've still got plenty of goat cheese because it freezes really well. But whether I'm going to have enough to last right through till April, I don't know. Anyway, why am I talking about milk at the moment? Well, because I've been thinking about coffee a great deal since I put it out there that I'm going to be partaking in some sort of challenges in 2021. I've had some feedback from you guys and I've started thinking about them a lot deeper. And this is the beauty of having you guys to talk to is you make me follow through with things and you give me the impetus to do things. I, I would never really have done these challenges if I was just living here and I didn't have any contact through either the YouTube channel or the podcast. But because I do, it spurs me on to do these things. And also over the course of the last year, because I've only been doing this about a year, it's really made me assess where I am and I'm not nearly as self-sufficient as I would have answered I was a year ago. I really thought I was, you know, providing much more of our food than we are. And it's having these channels have communication that has allowed me to sort of realise that, if you like. 
But, you know, we're doing the best we can and we're moving in the right direction. And that's what it's all about. But when it comes to these uh, challenges and they're basically they're based around me being completely self-sufficient. I'm going to do several different ones throughout the year. We're going to do, um, you know, I'm going to go a month where I only eat things, eat and drink things that I can produce here, do produce here and that have produced here. Um, I'm toying with the idea which was uh, feedback I was given in our Facebook group, toying with the idea of um, allowing bartering, but no cash trades. I really like the sort of structure of that idea for allowing me to have access to a few things that I otherwise wouldn't be able to have, but we're in a sort of constrained way. But, uh, it, you know, it's made me think about coffee. <laughs> and I bloody love coffee. I really do. I love coffee so much that... This is one of my Christmas presents, a coffee selection. That's how much I love coffee, but um, I'm definitely facing the point at which for the sake of self-sufficiency, which is a cause I believe in, I need to start thinking about changing my habits. So, you know, I'm saying all this while I'm making myself a coffee that I'm gonna blink in love, but I need to become less dependent on coffee. I need to be able to go without a, without coffee for a month if I'm going to, you know, make a success of these challenges that I'm setting myself. And there's lots and lots of different ways that I'm going to go about it. And I'm going to start just by reducing my intake. And I don't drink a tremendous amount. And the, the, the regular coffee that we drink is decaf. But I have it with uh, some... Latte sachets, which are not decaf. I, I'm, I really am just a consumer when it comes to coffee. But I want to get, there's a, I spoke about this on the podcast. I did a podcast quite recently all about replacing coffee. And there's a plant, a tea plant that grows quite happily in this climate. And if I want caffeine, then I'm definitely going, well, I'm going to anyway, but if I want caffeine, that really is the only route for being self-sufficient in this country that I think is, you know, a reasonable one to take. And I'm definitely going to be ordering an established plant if I can. I'm going to be looking into that later on today, seeing what I can get. And um, that's going to be a big help. That's going to be a big help. But I also love the taste. You know, I love decaf coffee. I'd rather have that than tea. So I'm just going to have to try and have a few less. Now, I only have maybe four or five a day. So I don't have masses. There are days when I have a lot more, days when I have a lot less. But I think I need to get down to maybe a cup a day or two cups a day. I think if I aim for two cups a day now, um, so if I can get on two cups a day by the end of January, I think that can work. And then I'm better placed to cut it out a bit more down the line. Anyway, that's where I am with that. And it's all about setting myself up to become more self-sufficient because as I always say, it's not just about producing more, it's about consuming less and changing your habits. I'm always, I try to practice what I preach. I'm always talking about eating seasonally. I'm always talking about eating locally. I'm always talking about foraging. These are all foraged items up here. And I try and practice what I preach, I really do. But I think coffee is the one area that I kind of give myself a pass on. So uh, my New Year's resolution for 2021 is to get a grip on that and be more honest about that. I'm phrasing my words very, very carefully. So I'm not saying my New Year's resolution is to give up coffee, but my New Year's resolution is to get a grip of that and kind of bring that into my holistic way of thinking about everything else and not give myself a pass on it. And I think that's all I need to do is uh, work in that direction. As always, it's not about a destination, it's about the journey, that's what I'm all about. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna have this coffee now, and then uh, we're gonna have a snacky tea for New Year's Eve. My wife and I will be in bed by eight o'clock, most likely, or nine o'clock, like usual. We don't wait up for New Year, but we've given the children permission to, and some snacks, so who knows where that's gonna go. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I'm going to sign off now and I just want to wish all of you guys a really, really, really happy, self-sufficient new year. Thank you so much for all your support in 2020 and I'll be back in 2021.